starting now, please? We have a wonderful group of speakers here for you today. We appreciate your uh, attendance. I'm the administrative officer for the grant. My name is Elizabeth Packer, and I want to welcome both the VA and the non-VA participants here to the Summer Institute in Aging, day four. And I hope you enjoy your day, and thank you very much for attending. Our first speaker is Dr. Chilton. The, uh, uh, I guess the rules and regulations are easier as we're trying through research projects and molecular stuff there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through some of the stuff in the United States and I'll take you across the, on the other side of the world and let you see what we're doing over there uh, to give you an idea of what's happening in atherosclerosis. Now I assume all of you want to live a long life. Uh, there's only a few people actually that get on the cat table at 90 years old. They usually have the same phenotype. They're thin, but they're not heavy because nobody else makes it to 90, and they're usually women. They usually have about a 10-year edge on most men, and if you take a look at their chromosomes, at the very end there's a thing called a telomere, and your telomere is shortened at about 50,000 base pairs per year. You're giving, you're giving quite a few when you're first born, but over time you beat those up, and when they get down to a short level, it sends off an automatic clock, and that clock is called autophagia, and autophagia will make your cells die, and you will age and you will continue to age, and eventually you will shut down. And it's kind of like an automatic clock in humans. So what you would like to do is preserve that speed of which you cut off your clocks. Let me give you an example. Uh, years ago, when I was in Hawaii for a meeting, we were looking at actually at an animal called a sheep, and they called it Dolly. And I think you guys heard it on the news. Do you remember what happened to the offspring after we cloned the small animals? We made some new ones, but they died at a super fast rate because the chromosomes that we gave them had already started the clock internally and they were shortening at the same speed as the adult and they died premature, called porgyria. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is take you through things that can s decrease the speed at which you shorten your clock at times and potentially increase your life expectancy. Probably the worst thing in humans that we have that we know of on a routine risk factor basis is high blood pressure. Now, there are people who have high blood pressure in the camp lab, and they'll tell you that, hey, look, my blood pressure's okay, and you measure it in the lab, and it's about 140 over 90. Man, that doesn't look too high. But if you look at their heart, and, and when you look at their heart, you find that they actually have a thick ventricle, like shown here, versus this thin one over here. This is left ventricular hypertrophy. How do you get that? Well, no different than if you went to the gym and you lift weights. Your arm gets hypertrophy. So if you have a high blood pressure over time, your heart continues to lift weights and you unfortunately will die at an earlier age. Inside the coronary artery, it's also very damaging. And I'll take you through the intravascular ultrasound in just a minute. But if you look down your coronary artery with an IBIS catheter, the guys that have atherosclerosis advance the fastest have high blood pressure. And you'd say, well, gosh, lipids are bad. Lipids are bad. But in a minute, I'll show you a slide. Lipids aren't quite as bad as high blood pressure. High blood pressure, in most of you here, over the next 18 months would accelerate your atherosclerosis. If you're normal, you still progress because you're getting older and you can't turn that clock down. So for aging and genetics, this is a hot area that we look at. And I'll take you into the nucleus of a cell in just a minute. But to start with, that's the kind of the basis of most things. Now this is technology that uh, Cliff and other folks in the room, the technical folks, at Septa and certainly Tony in the cath lab, 
we all deal with new types of technology. This is a new piece of equipment that is called near infrared spectroscopy or infrared X as the actual chemical uh, the actual name from the company. What it shows is this is your coronary artery right here, what you were born with. This shows you atherosclerosis that you guys get, and this is the little catheter inside. And I think actually Cliff made this video so that I could show it to you in a minute, I'll turn it on. But this correlates to the amount of cholesterol that's in this plaque. Now, why would that be important? It's because actually cholesterol in plaques means it's soft. Soft and necrotic cores actually rupture the most. The other thing they do is they send out compounds from inside this core that will thin this cap. Now that's a thick cap. That's probably close to 200 microns across. That's not the one that knocks you over. It's the one less than 65 microns. Most men will crack at the edge over here. Women won't actually crack this cap. They will erode the endothelial lining here, and that's at getting at increasing atherosclerosis. And you won't have endothelial cells, and I'll show you those in a minute. That's what keeps you alive. That is the skin lining all over your body. Now the heart, we can fix not too bad, but unfortunately we can't make you live longer when we fix it. Because you've got 60,000 miles of artery and veins that I don't touch, that are out of the realm of current technical skills. So for that other 60,000 miles, you probably ought to take care of your metabolics, which basically means eat healthy, keep your engine running well, exercise, and eat smart food. Uh, you don't have to, because we got stents for you, but stents will not decrease your heart attacks, they will not have decrease strokes, they will not make you live longer. I have nothing that I can offer you. I will get rid of your chest pain, but that's about all I can do. That's because the rest of your body is aging at a fast rate, and many of my colleagues in cardiology have not quite figured this out yet, but they still put stents in. And I think it's fine for temporizing, but ultimately, if you want to live longer, you're going to have to address the things that causes this atherosclerosis. Now, oscillatory stress, big word, it's called high blood pressure, same thing. So when you look at the scope, that's what you're looking at. Risk factors over here. Risk factors, one third of your risk comes from your mom and dad. You should have maybe picked better parents. If your mom and dad have diabetes, both of them have it, you will have diabetes before you die. It's almost 95% plus. If you have a person that has in your family a heart attack at age 45 or 50, then you have just shortened uh, your lifespan because they carry genetic signals that you cannot measure. I suspect many of you take statins in here. So you say, well, statins decrease my heart attack and death rate. That's true, that's correct. But 76% of people on statins don't get an effect, they still have a heart attack. But your number's lower, but you just didn't know it. That's because it only decreased 4% absolute risk. You were hoping for 75% reduction. That's relative risk. We're talking about absolute risk. Let me give you an example of absolute risk. Your car tire goes 100 miles. I have another car tire here that goes 104 miles. It goes four miles further. That's all you get from a statin is four miles. If you take high blood pressure measurement, I can actually get you to go to maybe 102 miles. You only get two miles more. Now, there's one that goes 140 miles, but nobody seems to be able to tolerate this pill. It's free. It's once a day. And it's diet and exercise. <laughs> okay? But nobody wants that. You want to live longer? That's the one. Now, do we know for sure that's correct? We do. We have animals. You put animals in, a, in an actual cell, and you check them. The one that lives the longest will be the one that's the skinniest little rat in there, and you will be able to run the photos because he had accelerated some pathways called AKT inside the cell that are your longevity pathways, and those are upregulated. How do we know this? From worm data, believe it or not. That's where it comes from. And you can look at each specific uh, cell all the way along. So as you look at these slides, keep in mind what's going on. Now, over here, along with the risk factors, certain lipids is included in here. There's many things that are also included in there that are not talked about a lot. But there are many types of platelet abnormalities. When I talk about things that are in the blood, that means the blood system itself. Platelets also activate many of the different signals that control atherosclerosis. So we're now moving from just cardiology and risk factors, we're going to move into an area of hematology, cardiovascular disease, and time. We have already moved from cardiovascular to metabolic related to diabetes, but another new area is going to be blood because blood carries signals. And if you want an example of it, the most common one would be when you have a heart attack, we tell you to take aspirin? That's because it is platelets. Platelets also have signals to control 
growth around your blood vessels, and they can actually signal the actual endothelial cells to make you grow stuff. So it's, again, a very important area. Uh, microRNA is new to you. You're probably familiar with just RNA. That's not what we're looking at here. What we have found is not only does the DNA send a signal out, and it comes out through the nucleus and comes down and lays across the ribosomes to send transcriptional signals to produce proteins to go to metatomonic signals like lipids. But microRNA is inside the nucleus, and what it does is it actually goes in to Watson and Crick's great DNA and lays on top of it and says, I want you to silence this part of your mom and dad's gene. And now what I can do is I can measure the silencing parts, and I can change animals to where those animals would have different silencing microRNAs inside the nucleus and get a totally different output of different compounds. So the microRNAs are not the same as messenger RNA. That's a little different. What we're going to do inside the nucleus is I'm going to change the nuclear DNA signals before it gets outside the nucleus, and then I'm going to actually give you a different product. And I'll take you to humans in a minute, and I'll show you where we've already done that a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the activation pathway. Uh, this is what keeps you alive. Now, this seems kind of uh, detailed, maybe in some respects. Right here is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is your life. If you have a low nitric oxide level, you will die earlier. We've already correlated with endothelial function, and we've done it with risk factors, and we've even done it with survival curves. So you can measure actually nitric oxide in very specific baths, and we can track that. Now, if you do these things over here, that's high blood pressure, and you want to not take care of yourself, then what you will do is you will shut down the good production of nitric oxide, and you will have what they call endothelial cell dysfunction. In the cath lab, many times, like yesterday, we would give nitro to an artery, and it gets bigger. That's because it's nitric oxide. If you exercise, you get bigger too. If you wake up in the morning, all of you have a third smaller coronaries. But as the day goes on, you produce more nitric oxide. So you do not want to be over here because this causes all these bad things. Vasoconstriction gives you higher blood pressures, more likely to crack a plaque. Smooth muscle proliferation, it makes instant restenosis. Platelet aggregation sets you up for clotting off any blood vessel you would like to pick. Here's the white blood cell adhesion. That's an infection. You get cut in the arm, and you will see white cells come there. Well, in the human body, you get the same thing with a heart attack. You tear that artery, and white cells are coming there. And so you're going to see the white cells increase. And at the same time, here's your lipids. Here's your things that are called Adolf's meat tenderizer. Now, most of you gals put on this stuff to, to actually beat up the collagen in a steak so it's not so bristly. You could put coke on it does the same thing. It's a collagenase. Well, in the human body, these are made right in the corner of plaques, and those can actually thin the cap that's made out of collagen and break it down. Peter Libby and other people in Harvard have done studies on this decade past. This is atherosclerosis, and this is vascular aging. That's why, again, having aging conferences is worthwhile. You can look at it. Now, let me show you how bad high blood pressure is. These are all studies, and I think we've done most of these here. We've done certainly periscope, I've done thread various here, we've done reversal here, but not in this building across the county, and we've done Camelot. Camelot was an actual study that looked at high blood pressure drugs. I think you can appreciate all the ones up there, are you familiar with them? Here's Norvask, here's an, uh, uh, an ACE inhibitor, an Alipro has been around for years, and then here's placebo. Now here's the way the study goes. Where it says B, that's baseline. That, I, I don't think anybody really cares the total amount of anthrosclerosis I'm measuring, but B is for baseline. If I follow you 18 months, 600 patients in each study, they're all the same reference lab, notice that you progress. And if you look up here, this is a high blood pressure study. The ages are very similar, but notice that high blood pressure studies have the worst atherosclerosis volume I got. So if I had to pick one thing you better get rid of, it's your high blood pressure. Now, what makes high blood pressure? Well, interestingly enough, most people, as you gain weight over time, you will actually have other signaling things that occur in your body that actually will generate pressure. Once you start to see that pressure rise, it's difficult to turn it down. Most things that you start in your body as far as high lipids and stuff like that, I can bring down a number, but I may not have been able to change the nuclear signals inside the cell that actually you caused when you had that for a number of years before you treated it. So the trick would be, is to give me the risk factors 20 years before you get one of these like high blood pressure. 
And that's currently in the proteomics research lab, that's what we're looking at. So what we would like to do is stop those signals from being stopped because I think once the cell gets in this cycle, it's difficult to return it back to normal. This is a Stradivarius study over here. This was a study that was done with a drug called Remenavon. Never made it to market because they all jumped off the bridge and had suicide. But they did lose weight. And if you do lose weight, you will find that you can decrease the progression of atherosclerosis. Here's the placebo arm, and they progress pretty quickly. This is sorting. So weight loss is proven by intravascular ultrasound to show a reduction in atherosclerosis. This is a reversal trial. Nobody wanted to do this. I did this trial across the street years ago. Here's why we didn't want to do it. It's people coming in with angina. And so what I'm going to do is, you get two choices. You can get a drug that's not quite as powerful or one that's a little less. And believe it or not, the more powerful drug beat out Provostatin. Guess who paid for this study? The guys who made Provostatin. You can imagine the guy that set the study up from BMS got fired the next day probably. Their stock trashed up to a billion dollars the next day. That's how powerful that study was. And this came out to have less progression. This had more progression. This doesn't lower your LDL as much. This one does it very well. So the drug that you take to bring down your LDL is important. Now, it's not just a number. I can show you people that have normal blood pressure that have left ventricular hypertrophy. So it wasn't just the number of blood pressure. We can show you people that actually take glucose and lower it, but you still have heart attacks and stroke at the same rate. So what you have to do is you have to understand there are pleiotropic effects that occur with these drugs beyond just the number that you treat the right. drug with. So atorvastatin has a lot of pleiotropic effects on nitric oxide that potentially benefits a person other than just the reduction. Now over here is the, one of the more interesting studies we had. Here's the periscope trial. The periscope trial when we did this, this isn't type 2 diabetes. So the question is, if I was to lower your hemoglobin A1C, <clears throat> that's great, but can you do more than that with the PPAR gamma drug? And when we did the study, what we found is that we don't change your LDL. But over in this group, you can see there's progression of atherosclerosis. In this group, it doesn't even change your LDL, it actually regress. So currently, the most powerful drug to regress atherosclerosis in humans is, believe it or not, biolidism. I have nothing better. But it's not sold for that. It's sold for diabetes. But forget the diabetes. If you put five stents in a gal and she's already had two bypasses and there's nothing left to do, uh, even if she doesn't have diabetes, you say, she, she's going to die. What would you like? You can try a research drug if you want. It's on the market, but it's still research if it's outside the realm of the FDA approval. And this probably would be the most powerful one that I have. Now, why potentially would this work? What happened was about two or three years ago, Dan Rader at the University of uh, Pittsburgh did a study in humans and it looked at the ability to remove cholesterol out of cells. And we compared a atorvastatin at the time, which was the most powerful lowering one that we had, to a drug called pyobidazone as just a red herring, thinking, well, it doesn't lower cholesterol, so why would it affect it? But what we found was at the top dose of atorvastatin, it Pyobidazone is four times better to remove cholesterol out of cells by the ABC transporters. So what it does through the PPAR gamut, it affects intracellular signals at the nucleus to change the nuclear transcriptional signals to actually remove cholesterol. And it has off-target effects. You can certainly gain weight. It does not cause structural heart disease. It can be used for diabetes, but right now everybody's kind of giving it a bad eye. It'll be bad because this drug is going to get cleared. You will still have, though, the weight gain from water retention. But it, again, is a compound that you're going to see more of. We are currently finishing a trial called aliglitazar, which is a drug that is twice as potent as this. And we just closed the trial. And hopefully, we'll have in the next four or five years answers on that one. And hopefully, that will be uh, equally or better than what we had there. Now, here is high blood pressure, again, as a risk factor for stroke. Most of you don't want to have a stroke, but you don't get to pick. You don't get to pick between a heart attack and a stroke first. Now, if you're in Asia, you get a stroke first probably, but here you get a heart attack first. If you look up here, high blood pressure is probably the number one when you look at it. But take a look at the next three. They look familiar? This is metabolic syndrome, folks. This is downright just flat. You need to lose weight. There is your lack of physical activity. There's your waist tip ratio, and there's your abnormal lipids. That fits diabetes, too. So if you want to decrease aging and you want to decrease your chance for stroke, there's three in a row that all point in the same direction. And interestingly as it may seem, the waist-tip ratio shown here of insulin resistance 
also fits this 70% of the time. They're all connected. So once you turn on this process, whatever this does, and, and uh, it, it really is anthrogenic. Smoking, I think most people, you know, most of the veterans that I saw years ago, we don't have any in anymore. They're mostly dead. We used to have a lot around. If you guys think about it, they used to be guys walking around, barely could get to the door. They're dead. They're just not around. Smoking, I think, in the U.S. has significantly decreased. This is the inner stroke trial. How many, how many patients? 15,000, and it's well around the world. So this is a good study. Now, this is translational biology. I know this is going to be, ooh, my God, I can't stand this. This is not hard. This is really easy. Okay. This is the uh, actual nucleus up here. This whole thing is a cytoplasm. Here's your mom and dad. They give you the red genes. Okay, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start modifying those red genes before they get out to lay across down here to make my new proteins. That's all it is. And now I'm going to start tracking the microRNAs. And I'll show you human studies. And this is probably not much better, about 48, 48 months old. But it's new technology. It's coming on so fast that we can hardly get the, uh, the stuff published before somebody else already be used to it. But I think you're going to find it's most interesting. What is this down here? This is making things like LDL cholesterol. It has to do with glucose transport across your cells, things like that. So it's really important to you because this is what circulates through your blood, again, as the actual biome. Down here, it shows you endothelial cells. This is the nucleus of the endothelial cell. And why would you be interested in endothelial cells? Well, you have six trillion of them. They're the maestro of your entire cardiovascular system from head to toe. They control all things initially. All of your blood touches the endothelium. So it's in a key position to control clotting. It controls the lipid effects. It controls, again, the inflammatory signals. It controls your life expectancy to a large extent from nitric oxide. The other thing it does, it decreases cancer if it's healthy. For example, if I was to measure the production over here of microRNA21, which we already have, and it jumps up five times, I can tell you that it will actually increase the ability to produce nitric oxide and decrease cell death. But free of charge, it will decrease cancer because P10 goes down with it. So it is, again, a target for cancer, and people that get older usually end up with cancers. We can track this, and we can target this. And so what we will do is we will find out that this particular microRNA may be suppressed. It is possible then to go back into the nucleus with a silencing microRNA and shut it down. And that's currently what we're looking at for drug targets. This microRNA is affected, uh, actually affects about 400 genes. And so there's a lot of places to target so we get a little bit more specific with specific microRNAs, which will be your new drugs in the future. This shows you the importance of microRNA. Now, I would suspect, if you look at the very end down here, glucose and diabetes rings a bell. High blood pressure rings a bell. Growth rings a bell. Insulin resistance, certainly connected to diabetes. Inflammation rings a bell because of HSCRP. If you back up, over here is where we give drugs like ACE inhibitors and ARB as an example. Those affect all the way through to these areas over here. Now, you know, I suspect most of you know that ARBs and type 2 diabetes is probably our choice for most of the people with type 2. If you have type 1, you know that we actually affect ACE inhibitors seem to be a better study. Why would you have the toll receptor sitting here? The toll receptor sits on the cell, and it actually controls atherosclerotic signals. If I can shut that off, it would be very worthwhile. If I give these drugs, they shut down angiotensin 2, which decreases stimulation to that because that controls these signals over here. These are very much human. And you can see we've divided them up into 146A and just 146 because they have different effects. We're now targeting those, and by doing such, we can improve over here, just as one example, here's an angiotensin receptor blocker, and look, we shut down inflammation, blood pressure, glucose levels increase because it insulin sensitizes to some extent, and insulin resistance is improved, and nuclear factor kappa beta is inside the nucleus it sends out all the bad hormone signals that actually cause you to get atherosclerosis. So you want to shut that one down. Let me show you an example. Humans. This is a cross-section of the same piece of tissue staying two different ways. This is staying down here showing you the atherosclerotic plaque. This would be the big the artery here. This is what's plugged up on the side like the first ibis picture. This is showing you all the signals coming out from microRNA. Down here is staying for ACE and lipids, and they both stay in red in this kind of purplish color. All of those are interconnected. And what happens is, since they're interconnected, you can see how they affect the endothelial cells. 
If I was to give an angiotensin receptor blocker and I want to affect this microRNA shown here, you can see that it can significantly decrease the signal at a molecular level. So when you take a drug like an ARB and you're controlling your blood pressure, you have to be dreaming. It's doing more. You're just measuring that number. It's doing a whole bunch more different things all over your body. So it has other effects that are far beyond just blood pressure control. We have animals, I'm not going to show you, that actually were taken the aorta and fed them the cafeteria food from the lunchroom, and they get atherosclerosis. But if you give them an ARB, they have significantly less. Same thing with pyoglitazone, same thing with statins. All these types of drugs can decrease atherosclerosis, and it's not related just to the number. This is human. That is a carotid artery inside. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to two different hospitals. The first hospital that was done actually takes a look uh, and finds that these microRNAs are markedly increased in all the patients that we took samples out of their carotid artery. And now I can tell you with 85% of surety which one of the patients is going to actually have a symptomatic event, asymptomatic and symptomatic. So when they first did the study, they eh, I'm not sure that's right. Let's go to another hospital. Let's take another. And you can notice these names aren't quite familiar to you, so that's because they're not from this part of the world. But look at these numbers. They exactly match these over here. So the microRNA signals that we have today could potentially tell you you have a hybrid block in your carotid. If those aren't elevated, you may be asymptomatic and you may not have to have any type of surgery done on your neck. Why would that be important? When you do surgery on the neck, there's a small percentage of strokes. And that's a hard end point. So if you didn't have to have it done, you might wait until you find that your signals are going up and you say, well, maybe it's now time as a marker that we consider operating. Here gives you just one uh, short cut. This is a three-page list, and I only decided just to take the top four just to give you an idea. Here's 145 I showed you earlier. Take a look over here and look what it affects. C-reactive protein. Here's the reverse transport pathway to get cholesterol out of your cells. It controls actually the uh, changes here on the actual GF1 pathway. Here's one down here that modulates smooth muscle cell growth. All those are important to you. I mean, I would suspect most of you like to have a stable plaque so it doesn't rupture. And that's what we're measuring. That's why in the carotid I showed you, those are the ones that would be more likely to rupture. Now, let me go to this for a second and show you why um, you need to pay attention to atherosclerosis and diabetes. Here's a blood pressure 145 over 93. I bet, I don't know if uh, either one, me, I don't know if you guys are in here or not. Tony, would you guys do this case? I can't remember. I, I think Cliff may be the copy of this. Here's a guy that, look, he doesn't have a block here. He comes back within eight months. And now, look, he's got a block in his coronary. It didn't take long. They're right here, this is our guy. And if you take a look, what he had was, he actually has a blockage that occurs suddenly without warning over here. He probably ruptured a plaque. And that's not, again, here's his glucose level over here, and here's his blood pressure. Diabetes is kind of tough on you. We, I as part of this segment, and I don't know if I can show it here, Here's an example of OCT, and here's one of IBIS. The OCT, if you look at it, you see how thin this camp is? This is an example of how thin this would be. This is optical coherence tomography, which we have upstairs. It has a resolution of seven microns. That's down to the endothelial surface. And you can measure this cap, and you can see the little soft liquid core. That's the kind of rupture, and that's the kind you'd like to see taken out with drug treatment or good habits and better lifestyle than put a stent in it. A stent may crack it, but it may not take care of the problem. And remember, there's only two feet in the coronaries. You've got 60,000 miles left. If you think that you only have one of these in your body, if I find one, I can find 70% of the time another one in the same set of coronaries. So they're all over your body. That's why people with diabetes have so many more events, is because they have so many soft plaques hanging around. Here's your endothelium on a scanning electron microscope. Here you can see where we've torn it loose from high blood pressure. These are some beautiful pictures that actually were done from my Chinese colleagues. Here's a rupture coronary from our lab that was done here a number of years ago. You can see how it's torn backwards. That's high blood pressure on top of a weak endothelium and probably, again, in a carotid core. This shows you, again, the advantage of taking animal models and just watching what happens with uh, different types of drugs. I'm going to use ARV again as an example. A normal example I would show would be a statin. But since everybody knows statins do that, it's not quite as uh, shocking as to see. Here's a blood pressure drug that does the same thing. Here is, again, the development of atherosclerosis that's seen here in the actual old oil red oak, which shows oxidative stress and lesion formation. 
Notice as I get more angiotensin receptor blocker, it blocks it, and notice over here it's completely gone. Now, of course, it lowers your blood pressure, but on top of that, it shows a safety effect that's better. If you have an off target effect that's detrimental, that would be bad. But here again, the calcium blockers, I mean, the angiotensin receptor blockers have been around for years and have shown good results. This shows you again the actual uh, reduced progression. Everybody progresses over time, and we're using IBIS. And here's the, again, angiotensin receptor blocker, which just controls blood pressure. But look down here. This is the ones that got the ARB. Here's the ones that didn't get it. And you can see they progress more atherosclerosis over time. So it's just not the number of blood pressure. It's actually many of the other pleiotropic effects some of these drugs have. This is an example of the effect of blood pressure on the actual heart and how you can block it with different types of blocking agents. I could put up here a beta blocker or anything pretty much, and you'll see here's the animal model here. Tie a string around the top of the aorta, make it really hypertensive. You can see it gets bigger, gets thicker. Here we lower the blood pressure, and you can see that it's smaller again. So blood pressure control is kind of important to you. Now, it's one of my favorite slides. The reason is, is because nobody believes uh, gaining weight is a particular problem. If you can go from a normal BMI and you can get to 50 and higher BMI, you're probably okay. The problem is you have to transition through the twilight zone while you have your infarcts and strokes. If you look at guys that are huge, I mean 60 BMIs, guys that weigh 450, 500 pounds, we've done autopsy series on that. And those guys don't die of heart attacks. They die of actually heart failure and sudden death. It's a different kind of disease. Somehow they either have a, a different kind of genetics that allows them to be that extremely heavy and don't get problems. But for everybody else, don't dream that that's the category you're in. You're probably not. But if you look, let me take an identical twin for just a minute and show you what happens. If you take an identical twin, which would control for all of your genetic background, so you can't say, oh, you know, this guy has different genes than I do. Let me take your identical twin. And I'm going to go across the United States and I'm going to find your twin. And if he weighs but roughly about 10 or so pounds more than you do, I'm going to measure his blood. And I'm going to measure your blood. And I'm going to compare the two and just see what risk factors potentially are environmentally activated. Not genetically, just environmentally, because your genes are the same. And if you look down here, you can find that, you, again, intra fat is significantly higher. doesn't look like as much because the bar covers the other ones. But this is significant. The liver fat is higher. Does liver fat correlate with cardiovascular fat? It does, and the mortality goes up equally as well. If you take a look at insulin, you're insulin resistant, which goes with high blood pressure. Inflammation, you're significantly <coughs> higher. Here's fibrinogen, makes you clot faster. Significantly higher, liver fat's higher. The whole thing, as you look along here, as you gain weight, here's your PI-1. Plasminogen activator inhibitor comes from endothelial cells. That makes you clot faster. Who has that? Type 2 diabetes. They shut down the good part called TPA that we give the thin blood, and we actually now make you very clot prone. And then at the very end, you can see the BMI are significantly higher. But you know, it's not huge. A 30 BMI, pretty common around here. You know, even in the cath lab, I think some of our guys are approaching 30 something. But I think you need to be careful because this is telling me measuring all these signals, every one of these are cardiovascular related. <coughs> now, let me show you another one. If you take phenotypes, which one of these guys up here dies the fastest, you think? Now, I know you guys are going to say, oh, it's the heavy one over here on the corner. Be careful. I wouldn't show you that if it's easy. The guy that dies the fastest is this cowboy right here. BMI is 22. This is 22. But the difference is this guy's slim and trim. This guy's got a pot belly. Pot belly guys don't do well. Here's the pot belly guys. Okay? And that's not old. That's a new study. That just came out, and it's not small. Here's 4,600 patients, and here's a, nearly a five-year follow-up. 15,000 of what they looked at. So if you're really, really heavy, you may not be as high a risk as the guy that's real thin, but, but be careful if you get that, you know, hot belly you're in trouble. Okay, now, let me come down to the latter part of the talk and make you think that stuff's pretty easy. Let me, let me take you to a different place. Now what I want you to do is focus on the brain for a minute. And uh, brain signals, since most people are connected with high blood pressure, brain signals are kind of important. So what I'm going to do in this part is I'm going to show you how salt will raise your blood pressure. And it will be equivalent if you took a diuretic. So you could potentially, 
Now I have to take a diuretic. Now, let me give you an example of how powerful little changes in blood pressure are. Two millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure will decrease significantly your strokes. Five millimeters will bring it down almost 15% drop in strokes. That's death. Just that much. That's all it takes. How much do you drop your blood pressure if I was simply to take and say, don't put any more salt on your food? We, most of you in here, around 10 to 12 grams of food, uh, salt today. Most of you would if, add, just take the salt off of your food. Don't add any to it. You will drop to around probably 5 to 8. That will drop your blood pressure probably 5 points. That's all it did. But it will take a mean. Over time, you'll be 5 points lower, which will decrease your stroke rate. Again, over, an, over your lifetime, uh, probably a good 15, 20%. That's pretty impressive for just simply just doing that. I guess the next question is, well, the food won't taste as good. You know, anybody ever heard of a salt receptor? There's not one. You learn to like this stuff. They put it in your food. Take it out for 21 days. You won't even know you missed it. You'll even taste the food. Most of you salt the food before you even taste the darn thing. Dietitian in the back here. She can tell you. You guys just do not, you, 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 under, you way overuse the salt. It is 75% of your salt you're going to get poisoned with anyway because I can't get it out of canned food, so you're going to get it. But if you just take what you add out, it'll be a significant player. So do your best to move away from that. Potato chips are good for my business. Over time, okay? We have done monkey studies at Southwest Research out here probably 15 years ago. And I can make you grow blood vessels and thicker vessels. And the actual psychologist monkey, if I give one salt loaded and one not. And over time, you will die early. So salt is not your friend. And if you look, the deer that you see running on the streets nowadays, we put salt like that. They like to taste the salt, but they have no receptor. But they come back to taste it again. So it's something you've learned. Don't, don't get surprised. I mean, salt is not something you need. So stay away from salt if you can't find things that are low salt. Now, let me go to the salt for a minute. So if I was to take you and open up your blood vessel and look down and look at your endothelium, I can do a scan on that. I can do a lumogram. And in the actual lumogram, I can measure your nitric oxide production. In humans, it's actually kind of a greenish colored gas that comes out. That's coming out from your endothelial cells because they're healthy. And they, that gas gives you about a six micron layer so that it keeps the blood in the center so it doesn't touch the endothelial cells. Because when it touches it, it sends signals to each other and starts atherosclerosis. Well, I can measure the amount of nitric oxide you produce. And here's an example. Here's a normal salt diet up here. And you can see there's a big chunk in the middle that doesn't have much red. The red is nitric oxide. Look at the one at the bottom. And you see the low salt diet, much more concentrated red when you add up all the counts. So you're producing a lot more nitric oxide, which is much more healthy to you than if you actually shut it down. So let's look at what you put out in the urine, because you can't take a history from a patient because they all cheat. It seems like everybody cheats on their salt. You ask them and they say, I don't eat salt, and then they're eating potato chips the next five minutes. So you gotta take their urine sample. You take their urine sample, here's the guys that have low salt. This is that skin. Here's the ones in brachial artery ability to vasodilate your blood vessels, which means you're healthy. Notice it's better with the low salt. So low salt is very worthwhile for you, and it decreases many molecular signals. This takes a look at Wabane, and this is a thinking cap part. Here's the high salt. Again, you can see it going up, and this is the plasma Wabane levels. As you take in more salt, you increase Wabane. There's an actual axis called the aldosterone Wabane angiotensin axis, not commonly talked about. It was argued for many years. And actually, over the last probably uh, two or three years, we've now found that this is a significant player. But what Wabane does, it goes into the actual brain. And when you increase salt, you increase Wabane production. Wabane goes over and it actually sends out a nerve signal, sympathetic nerve signal, to stimulate the adventitial areas by dripping noradrenaline on it and it vasoconstricts your blood vessels. So consequently, it raises your blood pressure. At the same time, it goes over here to the adrenal gland and it also increases Wabane. So Wabane levels, if you measure them, will correlate very nicely with your blood pressure and your salt intake. So it would be a good idea to keep those levels as low as you can because that's really the harder part of taking care of blood pressure. Now, closing out, the next one is totally a red herring. We didn't expect to see this. We've talked about it, but we didn't know. How much is inflammation going to you? 
Well, inflammation is what you guys would say is like an infection in your, if you got a sticker in your hand, you get an infection there. In the human body, if you raise your lipids, you may get an infection wherever that lipid goes underneath and becomes oxidized. And then the inflammatory cells come over and stick down. I can measure that inflammatory signal like a white blood count, for example. Well, if I was to say, is it possible, and people that have chronic stable angina, to give them a drug that shuts down inflammation, like Ultraseed, which is used for gout, but at a low dose, could I decrease cardiovascular events because you're shutting down the inflammatory process, which would weaken the cap on the plaque, and you would crack the plaque and have a heart attack. And it actually came out phenomenal. As a matter of fact, if you take a look out here, this is many, many months out, years actually, this is one of the most powerful studies I've ever seen. Here is, again, only 15 events in 280 people, or 5.3% over that period of time. And, uh, and again, all they did was really low-dose culture scene. But there's 40 events in the other category. Now, that means I only have to treat 11 people for the duration of this trial to show a benefit. Now, question, all of you like statins? This is better than statins. This has more horsepower than a statin. And it's simply a drug you take, even if you didn't have high uric acid. Nobody in here has got gout. These guys all have chronic angina. But if you look at the numbers, this is the most powerful study that we've had. So I think in time, as we learn how to look at new drugs, we're going to look at drugs like this one and others that we used to use all the time that actually may come back as anti-inflammatories. We have a methyltrexate study underway. Normally it's used for cancer. We're using it to shut down inflammation and see whether or not it would actually show similar results to this. I don't think I'm going to be in that arm, but there are people who are already in it. What's, uh, what's the dose? Oh, this is uh, 25 milligrams. The culture scene? Yeah. That's all they used. And you would thought, you, usually you use higher doses, and actually uh, it was amazing how much this came down. That's probably one of the more interesting absolute risk reductions I've seen in years. But that's a, one being discussed. This is an Australian study. Now, here's another one that's free. Uh, most of the cardiovascular drugs, for example, when you go back to lovastatin days and probostatin days, a 1% change would be pretty good. That would probably get you a decent P value. Well, here, you don't even have to take a drug. You just got to eat smart. And this takes a look at Mediterranean diet. 7,000 patients, 40% are taking statins. A five-year trial, primary endpoints is cardiovascular. And if you take a look, the ones, the two light ones, are the ones that have the Mediterranean diet, which is salad and reasonable foods, not steak and junky food like that. And actually, if you take a look, here's the control. And if you watch, it actually has an absolute risk reduction that's quite impressive for just simply food, just being healthy. So if I had to say anything one to do, i do lifestyle first, get my weight down for sure, because it changes all my nuclear signals. I would go after the diet after you get the weight down. Now, how much can you do as far as diet and exercise for weight? Diet, calorie intake is 80% of weight loss. You can be a long distance runner and you can get fat if you eat enough hamburgers, okay? One hamburger is about an hour and 15 to 20 minutes running. It's about, it's about 800 calories and all you get out of it. It's not walking, that's running. If you want to walk, you can walk 12 miles to your McDonald's store and eat one hamburger and when you walk back, you got rid of it. Okay? So if you think that uh, uh, there's, you know, there's nobody going to be, uh, you know, all the food you guys eat, your foods run all of my drugs. I mean, there's no drug powerful enough to compensate for your indiscretions in the environment. So if you want to decrease aging and eat healthy, that's the best choice. Now, there is some difference between these olive oil and the nuts. My suggestion would be don't cook the olive oil. You make it a transgenic fatty acid. That's anthrogenic. You need to put it on the salad. But don't cook it first, because then you break the bonds and it's not healthy. So be sure you keep that in perspective. This is the last slide. Up here is a fractured clock I showed you earlier. Watch this clot. That is platelets. So there's more to it than that. But you're into the now in the 21st century where we're going to be looking at the blood, and we're going to be looking at certainly the metabolic signals that go through that blood, because that clot up there is blocking that artery as much as it fractures over here. If you want to stay out of a cath lab, here's nine, nine modifiable risk factors that account for 90% of your first heart attack. That's pretty good. It's 95 for women. So what are the nine? All the ones you guys can do. Eat healthy, don't smoke, keep your proper weight. Stuff like that goes into this entire nine. 
But here's the big ones. Smoking increases your chance for a heart attack about three times. You guys all know that. Diabetes increases it. If you take a look, high blood pressure increases it. If I add them together, I can get you eight times increase. But since most people, how many people that you know have only one risk factor of your patients? They don't have one. They got usually two. 66% have two or three risk factors. So really, you fall over here for most of our patients. If you add obesity to it, just that one little touch, look at this one. This is, log this is logarithmic. 32 times younger. Now, I didn't even put orthopedic knees and hips because those are another problem, and those guys have bad accidents in the lab. If you put psychological stress, boom, 64 times. How many people come in that have a heart attack at a fight with their spouse? One third of my patients. So don't wake up on Monday morning and go to an angry boss. That would not be a good idea because you're probably going to fart them away. Uh, and I think that's my last slide. Any questions any of you have? That's a lot of material. I'll make you think for a little bit to start the morning. Uh -huh. uh, what are your thoughts about a vegetarian diet? Well, it's good. But, not, but you've got to be kind of careful. I used to have a guy working in camp at the Cliff Notes called Frank. So Frank's classic comment is, uh, Frank, uh, how are you doing on your vegetarian diet? He's doing great. Man, I eat steak every day. How is that a vegetarian diet? Well, the cows eat the grass, and I eat the cow. <laughs> Depends on how you call that vegetarian <laughs> diet, okay? <laughs> Other questions you got? Uh -huh. Good. Man, you're asking a very interesting, you want to talk about the human biome. Uh, that is the hottest other topic going, but I left it out. She wants to know about bariatric surgery, what it does. Well, bariatric surgery will reverse insulin resistance, decrease blood pressure, and as you saw in the recent trial, just recently published again, they showed the same thing they've shown in the other trials. Uh, it helps, but the problem is you take a hit and have surgery. There's another way you can put a bulb in your belly and you can pump it up. Doesn't do as good, doesn't decrease insulin resistance as well or stuff like that. The latest one out that's not in the United States yet, but we've been doing papers and research on it for two years now, is a sleeve that goes down your throat and it bypasses the stomach. It goes into the duodenum and then this plastic sleeve can be removed whenever you would like. Now, the question is, is what is making this change? Oh, and one other thing, I can take the duodenum in humans and switch it around, just cut it and re-implant it and it will get rid of insulin resistance too. That's the other one. This is the, the, the human biome. 80% of all of you here are made up of bacteria. Your bacteria have the ability to do some very fascinating things. For example, in some of my cows, if I want my, my cows to gain weight, I change the bacterial or gut flora. And what that does is one bacteria, let's say, produces three calories per bacteria versus I have a different bacteria that I can get seven or eight calories per bacteria. So I can make it get fat. I can take an animal that is fat and give the fat bacteria from his colon into the other animal and he will he will get that and I can reverse it do the reverse and that's why I see probiotics it's a really hot area right now so the human biome it is possible to change your bacterial colonization which affects all of your gut tracts which affects all of your lipid absorption affects all of your ability for inflammation signals I would suspect that the GI tract is a major player in the development of atherosclerosis but we just haven't got there yet and gastroenterology is still it, away from cardiology quite a, quite a ways, but it's not out of my rim of look because I think that's going to be a major player. Give you another example. H. pylori people took these triple drugs. Do you know most of those people also lost weight? And if you look at people who had surgery, they may get better, but they aren't quite the same weight. They come down or they take antibiotics and you start losing weight. What you're doing is you're shifting your bacterial flora, and that bacterial flora accounts for calories. So it does change insulin sensitivity. It could be that in time we will give drugs. It is possible the current drugs that you have affect that bacterial flora when you take it, but we don't think of them as drugs there. We're looking at just the number, and the number is not the ticket. Example, I've got three trials for you, VADT, advanced in the cord. We lowered the glucose level. People still had heart attacks and died. Well, you lowered the glucose, what the heck happened? You know, it just doesn't work. It probably because you didn't hit the target, and the target's insulin resistance. So you've got to look at to make sure you got the right target. Examples of right targets. LDL cholesterol, that was the right target. High blood pressure, that was a good target. But glucose is a marker. It's not a target so much. If you don't drink the glucose, though, you get blind. That's a target. 
for micro is important, or you get kidney trouble. So those are two. Number one cause of blindness in the United States, diabetes. But you've got to control the glucose. Kidney the same way. You do a great question. So I see food science is going to change the way we practice. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything that uh, indirectly supplies nitric oxide that's only the county? Yes, there is. Run. <laughs> there is also, you can eat spinach. Spinach in the mouth actually causes an activation of a pathway called cafe inside the nucleus. And it will actually upregulate nitric oxide, equivalent to taking nitro. Spinach does. Fresh. It's done in your mouth immediately when you take it. And you can look it up in Science Magazine. And in the one on the bacteria, the cheese calming out is actually on nature on the front cover, but it also has a warning. It says, do not do this. This is strictly research. Because what they did in the animals, they took and changed by antibiotics, the bacterial colonization, they changed the weight tremendously and dropped insulin resistance and blood pressure. But it's research still. There's not time to keep up with the antibiotics. Antibiotics, we did the wizard trial here with Bob Rourke years, years ago, 15,000 patients, not all from here, all over the world. And we did not show a benefit of decreasing cardiovascular events, but we didn't test for anything else. It could have been you decreased diabetes, but you just didn't know it. 80% of diabetes type 2 would not be here if people were not overweight. 80%. Children born in the year 2000, one third will be buried by their parents, both alive, because the kids got type 2 diabetes. Um, do you, since it's been shown that inflammatory markers increase the, the risk for cardiovascular mm -hmm. diabetes, Well, for homocysteine, which they actually the government kind of ruined those studies because uh, about 1990, the uh, FDA mandated that all flour have vi uh, vitamins put in it and folic acid. So we don't really have very many high homocysteines. Now, there are a rare group of people who do carry that. As far as doing the HSCRP, I think it's still research. Paul Rickers made a big deal, but, in, but outside North America, it's not thought of very well. It's just a marker. If it's high, it's bad. But I can do the eyeball test and say, you know, for your high CRP, lose some weight and exercise. But people don't want to do that. So how would you like for me to compete with obesity and fat and stuff like that when I can't control your risk factors or you just want me to give you a drug? I can control your number. But I didn't make you live any longer because I didn't control your real risk factors. I would suspect in order to do that, you've got to come all the way down with your weight, close to just above starvation for most people. Even guys like me who's trying to lose three to five pounds, I can promise you, you say, oh, Bob, you're skinny. I'm uh, not. I have to struggle just like everyone else. It is harder for me to lose than I think some people are heavier because it's easier to drop a whole bunch of weight than if you're real close and you want to just lose a little bit more. Your body is so smart, it's amazing. You have to give yourself plus or minus two pounds every day. But for you to consistently stay down below that, you know, uh, it's going to be tough. And it will take uh, it will take a number of weeks to do. You do, oh, another thing on losing weight. Crash diets are not so smart if you want to save muscle. A crash diet will make you eat up muscle mass. You want to do a slow, gradual, because that's fat mass. Muscle mass is lost immediately when you do that. The other thing you can do is you need to pump iron. Don't just run. If you're a long distance runner, you, I did that for years. You will not extract glucose as well as if you pump iron and do that because you're putting on skeletal muscle that sucks glucose out. So it's better to be cross trained. Uh -huh. I just want to make a comment about the vegan diet with the other person asked. Vegans are a plant based diet, and I was involved in a study, and we had about 200 subjects in the study, and it did work. You need to find a diet you can live with. You know, there's a TMAO product that I'm not going to talk about. Oh, I've got five minutes left? Oh, good. 300 seconds. 
Uh, so uh, basically, if you eat steak, there's an actual study that was done recently in the New England Journal of Medicine on eating steak in the TMO that has a survival curve. And the more steak that you eat, the higher the CMA level in your body, the actual increase in mortality. So the steak levels need to be to a reasonable portion. For most Texas folks, it's probably not what you're thinking a reasonable portion is. You know, you need to probably look at it, maybe a coffee cup uh, plate would be a better size. But, you know, I think the diets is whatever you can do to lose weight. If you want to get your weight down, and then you want to argue about diets, come and see us. I can show you different kinds of diets and stuff. But it's really academic. You've got to cut the calories. It's calories, calories, calories. I don't care what you say it is, it's calories. Look on the dang bar, and if it says 200 calories, that's 200 calories. Two of those, you got, you know, one of those will probably run maybe, I don't know, 45 minutes, 30 minutes. You want to eat two of them, you got to run nearly an hour. I mean, if you put it in terms of like, gosh, I don't want to do that. You know, pick your choices. A good trick for uh, not being hungry is try eight bites at 60 calories. If you put the entire half carton in and cook a huge amount of eggs, it's only 120. Is that a rough estimate? I think it's pretty close. You, you can eat a lot of stuff like that. That's pure protein, and your body will shut down. Leptin signals are the thing you're targeting, along with PYY that comes out of the brain, goes down the kidney, and a bunch of other junk. We got a real strong diabetes section here. If you got questions about diabetes, go see those guys. They really know this stuff. Thank you very much.